Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about motor unit recruitment during different types of movements. So we know that the size principle orders most of our recruitment. Um, so our motor unit recruitment occurs in order from smallest uh, motor neuron to largest motor neuron. Now I wanna emphasize that that's different from the size of the motor unit itself. So a motor unit is small if it has only a few fibers or large if it has many fibers, but that's different from the size of the actual uh, motor neuron um, and the size of the fibers that the motor neuron uh, commands. Okay, so the size principle says that our motor neurons are recruited in order from smallest to largest, regardless of the size of the motor unit itself. Um, so that holds true in most cases, but you'll see as we go through this lecture here um, that that doesn't always hold true. So we'll talk here about where there are some differences. Um, so the task that we are trying to complete uh, is also going to play a role in the order of uh, motor unit recruitment and in the rate coding. So how quickly um, the action potentials arrive at the motor neuron, how close together they are. Um, so muscles, some of our muscles um, are divided into anatomical compartments. There are actual uh, divisions anatomically in the muscles that separate different motor units. Um, so in some cases, depending on the task and depending on the muscle, um, we might have uh, motor units that are activated from different anatomical compartments. Um, we also can have motor units that are activated based on functional groups to execute a task. So where they're not anatomically divided, um, but where they are recruited based on the function that's required. So what is the actual movement that has to take place at this joint, for example? Um, so, you know, most of our muscles have, have several actions that they can conduct at a joint. Um, and so what we're saying here is that different motor units within that same muscle might be activated depending on uh, what the functional task is or what the actual movement is that we are aiming for at that joint. Um, and so those differences in uh, which motor units are recruited would happen at the central programming level. So it happened um, coming from the central nervous system where we're making the motor plan um, that motor plan might be different depending on uh, what the joint actions are that are involved, we would activate potentially different motor units within the same exact muscle. Um, so muscle spindle excitation also can have an effect on the order of recruitment. Again, that would be a central programming uh, difference. Um, so the way that we plan the task in the cerebral cortex, we would plan the text task differently or plan the muscle activations differently um, if it's an action where we have an excessive amount of muscle spindle excitation, like when the muscle is lengthening during contraction. Um, muscles use different strategies to increase force. So depending on the different muscles, we do, depending on what muscle in the body that we're looking at, some muscles will use rate coding to increase force as opposed to recruitment. Um, so in certain muscles, we might activate the recruited motor units to a greater extent, but there might be a limit to how many motor units are recruited at any given time. Whereas in other muscles, um, there might be a large amount of recruitment up to full capacity um, where rate coding is less utilized. Um, and then in some cases, it's both. Um, but different muscles in the body have different, you know, act preferentially in one direction or the other, where they might uh, preferentially increase rate coding versus increasing um, recruitment. So for slow ramp isometric contraction, so where it's an isometric contraction, the, the muscle's not changing in length during contraction, and we're slowly increasing in generation of force. Um, what happens is first we recruit the low threshold units, which would be um, the smaller motor neurons with the smaller fibers. So those would be the type one motor units. Um, and those would increase in rate coding. So the, the 
action potentials would be arriving closer and closer together. As the rate coding is increasing, then we're also going to continue to recruit the higher and higher threshold units, meaning the larger and larger motor neurons, meaning we're going from slow twitch to intermediate to fast twitch and everything in between because it is a spectrum. Um, so we're starting with the smaller motor neurons, the type one. Those are increasing in rate coding. Simultaneously, we're going to start to recruit the larger and larger motor neurons with the larger fibers. And those then will also increase in rate coding. Um, so that strategy makes it so that the low threshold units, meaning the slow twitch motor units, are not going to reach their maximal firing rates before we've achieved maximal recruitment. So we will have recruited the maximal um, motor units that we intend to recruit based on the central programming for the task. Um, before we've achieved the maximal firing rates of the slow twitch fibers. So it's more efficient that way. Um, if, we did accre if we did achieve the maximal firing rates of the slow twitch motor units, then that would be a lot less efficient um, than recruiting more motor units. Um, so recruitment is more important for the earlier recruited motor units as opposed to the rate coding in terms of increasing force. Um, and then firing rate becomes more and more important as the force increases. So it's more important to uh, the motor units that are recruited later. Um, so that would be more of the intermediate and fast twitch motor units. The firing rate is gonna be more important for um, increasing force for those units. Whereas recruiting more uh, motor units is gonna be in more important for the slow twitch fibers. So then when we're going in the other direction, so a slow ramp um, isometric contraction, but now we're reducing the force and ramping back down again, um, the D recruitment thresholds are on average 25% lower than the recruitment thresholds. So what we mean is at, on the way up as force is increasing, if the threshold was here to activate the neuron, then on the way back down for that same neuron or that same motor unit, the threshold to turn back off again is about 25% lower. So what that means is the motor unit that we're referring to here, this theoretical motor unit, would stay on to about 25% longer, <laughs> for lack of a better way of explaining that. So they would the same motor unit would remain active for longer when we're um, de-ramping or de-recruiting um, than where it came on on the way back up. Um, so on the way down, more motor units are firing at a lower frequency to form the same or to produce the same force. Okay, so on the way up, we are recruiting more and more motor units and rate coding is increasing. And then on the way down, we're still keeping the same number of motor units recruited up to a certain point. They're staying on 25% longer, essentially, but the rate coding would decrease. It would go more slowly. We'd have more space in between um, activations uh, so that we're producing the same amount of force, but with a greater number of motor units on the way back down. So maintained isometric contractions obey the size principle. So we recruit in order uh, from smallest motor neuron and therefore smallest muscle fibers to largest motor neurons and largest muscle fibers. Um, and that holds true. Um, and the same motor units are recruited uh, for isometric contractions that are occurring in different directions. Um, so again, there's no movement because it's isometric, but the direction that the force is aimed. So like the difference between like this isometric force and this isometric force, although we might be activating the same muscles in the thumb and in the fingers, uh, the direction of the force is different. And what we're saying here is that even when the direction of the force is different, um, generally speaking, the same motor units are still recruited in the same order, obeying the size principle.
So concentric contractions are a little bit different from isometric contractions. Um, so it still obeys the size principle. We still go smallest neuron to largest neuron um, in terms of order of activation, but the recruitment thresholds are lower if we're uh, concentrically contracting, contracting compared to an isometric contraction. Um, so the order of recruitment happens the same, but the recruitment thresholds are lower. So the neurons activate at a lower threshold. Um, the reduction is more significant at higher speeds of contraction. So that makes sense if you consider the force velocity relationship where the faster the contraction is occurring, the lower force is able to be produced. So at higher speeds of contraction or higher velocity, if we want to achieve the same force, then we need to have a greater amount of recruitment to overcome uh, the high velocity of that contraction. So that makes sense. Um, it's more pronounced for lower threshold units. So the units that are going to activate earlier are going to activate even earlier because their recruitment thresholds will be lowered um, to a greater extent than the higher threshold units. Uh, firing rates are also higher during concentric contraction than isometric contraction uh, to produce the same torque. Uh, central programming to complete a task can affect which motor units are recruited depending on uh, the, if the task is dynamic or isometric. Okay, so a lot of the changes in recruitment happen from the central programming level. So when we are planning the task, so when we're planning the muscle activations to complete the task, um, part of the consideration is whether the muscle actions um, are going to be concentric, eccentric, or isometric, and that will change which motor units are recruited. Okay, in eccentric contraction, at the same load, muscle activation is less during the eccentric phase than during the concentric phase. Um, so there are a few reasons for that, and it's not totally understood. There are still some question marks here about why it works this way. Um, but at the same load, um, we'll have less muscle activation to achieve the same amount of force, but moving in the eccentric direction rather than the concentric direction. Uh, so it could partially be because of inhibition of motor neurons during the eccentric contraction. Um, and that would be because we inhibit the motor neurons that would cause too great of a contraction because we don't want to cause a concentric contraction. Um, we don't want to fight against the direction of the movement. So we inhibit some of the motor neurons that are uh, supplying that muscle that's supposed to be lengthening. Um, so that could partially be why there's less activation during eccentric than concentric. Um, and spinal cord circuits are also altered in their excitability during eccentric contraction, probably for similar reasons. Um, not all motor units are affected to the same degree by these inhibitions. Um, and so that changes the behavior of the motor units. The order of recruitment is still generally smallest to largest, still follows the size principle, um, but the nature of how they are recruited and their activation patterns are different in eccentric contractions compared to concentric. Um, the central nervous system also uses different programming strategy for eccentric versus concentric and versus isometric. Um, so when the brain is planning how we're going to activate the different muscles to execute the task, an important consideration is whether um, each muscle re will require shortening, lengthening, or to stay the same. Uh, during eccentric contraction, there is more synchronous activation during eccentric contraction compared to concentric. So in concentric contraction, the activations are asynchronous. And then in eccentric, they are more synchronous. So the bilateral deficit phenomenon, um, it refers to a slight loss of maximal voluntary force during bilateral contraction compared to unilateral contraction. Um, so there is this phenomenon where if let's say we're doing a bilateral bicep curl, we will be able to generate less force than when we do a unilateral 
bicep curl. Now that is doesn't hold true for all people. Some people actually have what's called bilateral facilitation, where they're actually able to generate more force bilaterally than unilaterally. Uh, but it is more common for there to be a deficit than for there to be facilitation. Um, that can hold true during isometric or dynamic contraction, so it's not specific to any one type of contraction. It doesn't apply to all muscles or muscle groups, but it does apply. It has been demonstrated in the literature in many different uh, specific muscles and groups. Um, now, it isn't clear if what it's not clear at all what is actually going on. It, nobody knows what the mechanisms actually are that cause this phenomenon. Um, and it isn't clear if it has anything to do with activations or recruitment um, because probably because surface EMG isn't sensitive enough to detect the very slight difference that would be occurring if that were the case. Um, so it isn't clear. We don't know why this is happening, but it's been demonstrated again and again and again in the literature. All right. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.